I'm Rich, Rich Barczewski. I'm from Delaware. I'm on, on the board as a uh, uh, at-large member, and uh, I raise wild waterfowl, but I started a long time ago with predominantly chickens, raised a lot of game birds too over the years and things like that, so I've been doing that for 50 years, so it's, it's been a long, long run. Uh, I'm, I'm a trained animal scientist in my background. That's, that's what I did, and I'm retired now. So now I'm just having fun. I'm Dave Wolfpack. I'm one of the charter directors of the club. We started this back like in 86, I guess it was. Or no, 1986. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> professionally, I'm a retired biologist, actually a pharmacologist. I've been a pharmaceutical researcher for 30 years. And uh, I've been raising all kinds of poultry since I'm about 10. I'm 72 now, so that's a long time to make your patients go to work. I've, I've tried all the manual methods, the styrofoam incubators, and uh, now I have to monitor everything with the digital archon incubators to keep track of the humidity loss, the weight loss, and plot uh, everything out. Predominantly, uh, now I've been keeping uh, mostly geared pheasants and tragopans, and a tragopan might lay anywhere from three to five eggs a year, so you want to make sure you optimize your output to make sure you have birds that are like five, six, seven dollars a pair. You want to make sure you every egg that you, that you get. If you have any questions about the artificial incubation, I've actually designed it and built some of my own incubators as well. Get me up with uh, off land species. I, I don't create water fell. That would be the richest experience. Hello, my name is Donnie Woodburn. I'm charter of this thing back in 96. And uh, my wife and I, <laughs> And uh, Dave and Earl Starr, and we're the only four originals left from the beginning. So we felt a need for this in the area because it wasn't anything within Pennsylvania. So we just, uh, we have raised mainly everything, but mainly pheasants and doves have been our interest. And uh, we've been trying to retire for 10 years. And now we actually have, we're down to cover 85% of our stuff. And back the other night, if somebody can help me, I emptied three pens I didn't want to. I had like a meat or something, and uh, it just destroyed three pens of birds. Unbelievable. So we're kind of in a quandary of what to do about like that. So, so you cut way back here down to yeah, five thousand. Those three pens I didn't want to get rid of. So yeah, it's pretty bad because it's good pens. We had filthies that we used quite a bit, and uh, I lost about all of them. So, so anyway, that's the main one. Questions? Certainly, what we put y'all to sleep. So everybody, everybody had to sleep five percent or better of the eggs they put in their yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Danny, what are you guys? What's, I, I've read Bantams and I've read Silkies. Which would be better if you're going to use somebody else, to, especially with pheasant eggs? I've, I've tried Silkies and they're, they're pretty good setters. The only problem I found with silkies is they hate to get off the nest. So oftentimes they would leave the nest for three or four days at a time and then wind up pooping in the nest and soiling the eggs, which is not always a good thing. Uh, and then bantams are, are, it depends on what kind of bantams you use. I used to use a, uh, a jungle fowl and a cushion cross. They seem to be the best part of the But now I use it exclusively electronic incubators. Um, I, I wash every egg. You have to, all my incubators are cleaned and sterilized twice a year. You bring it at the end of the year. And every egg is, is washed and sterilized before I put it in the incubator. If it's got fecal material on it or mud, I scrape that off with a razor. And then I don't wash the eggs and rub the cuticle. I just make up a solution of bond detergent and either a quaternarium ammonium compound or a little bit of Clorox. And I put the, the eggs in a wire basket and I dip them down for about a minute in 110 degree water, lift them up, and then put them on a drying rack to let them dry. I ship a lot of eggs in the mail all over the country and most of the people request that I send unwashed eggs. So they're the only eggs that I don't clean. And whenever I take eggs out of the nest, I wear rubber gloves, whenever I handle the eggs, put them in, in, in a cooling box or a picking them up out of the incubator and canning them. 
I wear gloves then too. But keeping that, that oil from your fingers off of the shell is extremely important. And any kind of bacteria that you have on the eggs, it only takes one contaminated egg in an incubator, like Rob was saying, to destroy an entire hatch. I mean, one, back, one egg with bacteria in it that explodes because of the heat, you get the egg contents all over your incubator and everything. So that's why my microbiological training tells me sterilize everything from the beginning, beginning and stay with it all the way through to the end. That's just some of the things that I found very successful. And that, that's why it's so important to camp. Because you can monitor those eggs and catch those bad you eggs catch the bad ones before they blow. Exactly. Yeah. And nothing worse than a blown duck egg. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention the smell. So. Yeah, they're <laughs> terrible. Duck eggs are terrible. terrible. Dog 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 What's that? My dog <laughs> Well, I guess I have a question for all you guys while you're up there. Do you believe in disinfecting your hatchers after every hatch, or Absolutely. do you let subsequent hatches go? Absolutely, yep. After every hatch, I take the hatcher all apart, take it outside, hose out all the gum, yeah, that's why. wash and sterilize. There's a you fundamental answer there. and there's a real answer. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> fundamentally, yes, they should be. Um, yep. But in practice, I don't do it. I, mean, no. I just. Uh, I don't, I don't try, try to start out with them really clean to start with, yeah. and occasionally I do spray disinfectant in mine. Uh, I use a Tectrol spray, okay. and I spray that, and I'll use that sometimes in the incubator too as well, okay. but, but try to start out as clean as you possibly can be. But if you're, if you're in a situation like where you're getting eggs every couple times a week where you have to put them in, it's very, very difficult to totally, not, not possible, but difficult to totally clean down. What with that said too is like, we deal with, I don't know, at any given point, 80 species, we got 125 species all together. We're dealing with 80 species or so at any given time. Yep. So you have maybe not 80 different hatch, different hatch uh, incubation times, but you probably have 20 or so different, so it gets pretty hectic and chaotic. And, uh, under the banners, we don't have problems. We just yep. put them under the banners. Right, right away. Yeah. You know, but an incubator is chaotic. You know, even if you do the, the numbering system, like I said, I've tried before, and um, you get lost really fast. You know, with the incubator, at least we do. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks. Thousands. My hatch hunter. I'm not hatch hunter. <laughs> <laughs> and I, my hatcher, hatcher, I never have a day that does during the height of the season that there's not something in it. Because I'm setting on one day yep. and we're hatching probably five, six days a week. And you get some that are slower and some faster. So, yeah, it's difficult during the middle of the uh, hatching season to break down. disinfect correctly. Well, thanks, guys. What's a good disinfectant to use in your incubator? What's that? What is a good disinfectant to use? I use Tectrol, but that's it's a spray you can buy from a lot of the uh, farm supplies. Like Tractor Supply? I don't know if Tractor Supply sells that one or not. I, I, I buy a lot of my uh, my supplies from uh, Smith Poultry and Game Bird out of Kansas. Oh. I find them to be as reasonable. So you, you could wash it with anything. I mean, don't yeah, dish 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 and then just do it. I don't really. Chlorine's not the best to use, but if you keep it around that for 200 parts per million, okay. um, it's probably as chlorine as you can use a primary ammonia compound or really anything, even alcohol. You could spray it in to, you know, to reduce, to sanitize it after you clean it. So you know, you, you can use a whole spray. So, I, I use that 409, is it what it's called, it's spray. Oh, yeah. um, that's one chart that I gave came out of the incubation workshop, and it lists all the uh, different products and okay. the uses. So go, go back to that and refer to it. Yeah. Thank you. So, so if you got some spore-forming bacteria, like, um, I don't know, just a spore-forming bacteria in your incubator, you might want to not want to use something like, uh, uh, you, you'd probably want to use something like a, Quinary ammonia because that would be, or, or maybe I don't think alcohol would get a spore form of bacteria, but like quinary ammonia or even uh, uh, chlorine. So, you know, but there's just, there's a whole bunch of different uh, disinfectants and stuff you use. I raised predominantly pheasants, and this year I had probably 80% males. Is there any magic formula? 
next year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah next, I was about to say the answer is next year, right? So that's, that's actually it. Yeah. I'll leave this with, with our waterfalls, I've got some species like copper black dogs. Now they, they run like not not a lot. Most of the dogs don't run as much as they should for prices, but they run about four hundred dollars a pair or something like that. And uh, I always end up wholesale like last year I wholesale all the males out for like twenty bucks a piece. Guess what I got this year? I got all females. <laughs> it's a no trick. Yeah, it's 50, it's a 50 50 shot on each one and it's yeah. it's just like you know sometimes if you go to the to the to the uh, cracks table you can run <laughs> seven 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 and then sometimes you can't get the seven frame and that's he said 50 percent is 50 percent for egg. each one each for egg. egg not 50 percent for the point right. yeah 50 percent yeah, yeah. each individual breeding or you know fertilization is, is 50 50. okay yeah, in the end, it works out. If you if you tracked it over ten years, ten or twenty years, you'd probably be pretty close with it. <coughs> but you have some instances where we have some inbred lions that are tended to throw. Yeah, and whatever it is, right? We went from all males to all females. Well, back when crested dogs used to be a bird, not a really common dog, but there was still represented quite a few zoos and dark black And I, I and this is all just. Based on the observation, nobody's actually doing studies on it. But we see we saw a trend where it was just all females had for years and years and years. And uh, then before you know they disappeared. Wow. And unlike reptiles, you the temperature um, variance doesn't set the uh, sex of the egg like in reptiles you can incubate to have a million. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it's all it birds, it doesn't work. That's that's one of the things that that you'll see on the forums on Facebook and stuff like that is people will make the assumption that if you incubate them at a higher temperature, then you're going to get more males or whatever. That's not true. It's just it's just like there's people out there that believe that, and I've seen it. You don't have to turn an egg. Why do you why do you turn the eggs and incubate? You don't have to turn them. I, I I never turn them. Well, you know if he can get away with it, good luck. But I sure as heck ain't going to try. There's also it hasn't worked for some me. new technologies like it actually sex the fur balls in the egg. You go a little hole and you take a little blood sample and you send it off for DNA sex. <laughs> so you can just kind of throw away all the all legs and shit. Sure. Yeah, the, the hot thing in the commercial poultry industry is they're they're trying to figure out how to treat the eggs in the incubator to be able to eliminate males right. for like for egg laying lines. Wow. And they're 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 having some success. I think in Germany with in Israel I think I saw yeah, right. somebody doing it. So you know we can do it with uh, with mammals. They actually center you have the X and Y chromosome in mammals where the, the Y chromosome is smaller than the X chromosome. So they put the semen sample in a centrifuge and centrifuge it and then they they pull off the, wow. the, the, the female uh, spermatozoa that are for females would be at the bottom of the tube and they actually separate. You can buy sexed semen for cattle right now. Dairy cattle, so some dairy farmers, <coughs> what they're doing is they're breeding the absolutely best cows for females so they can have them for the herd. And then the other ones, you know, they, they'll breed the other cows that they don't need the females from to beef bulls to make, make meat instead of having veal cattle. So, uh, you know, I, the technology's coming for that, but w whether it'll ever get down to our level where we're doing this from, you know, yeah. more of a hobby standpoint than a... Yeah, you have an AI. Yeah, you have an AI. Thank you. Thanks for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish, wish I had better news. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Is it true that you can sex uh, the chicken by the shape of the egg itself? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, nor can you sex it using a string. Uh, yeah. She's she's right. I don't know why the point, more pointy is the rooster it and work. Oh, it no. doesn't work? <laughs> no, not even close. That, there's, there's people that believe it though. Oh yeah. You know. Which I was talking yeah. The sex witching. Yeah, witching. Yeah, voodoo. It's fifty percent correct. Yeah, down to right. That's it. Yeah. Well, it just depends on the song that was played that night. Yeah, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and that makes it tough. Yeah.
Uh, just curious, uh, we've touched on it before, but everybody's concerned about the bloom on the egg. Do you clean the egg as soon as you collect it, or do you clean it right before you put it in the incubator? I clean them as soon as I bring them into the house. Yep. Yeah. It's the sooner the better. Yeah. Yep. Because if they're sitting in the nest on that straw and the head's gone back every day, she, like they were talking about, they've got that oil on the bear's bottom of their chest and they're rubbing that on the eggs. But I wear gloves when I take them out of the nest as soon as I come in. I've got the water warmed up to 110 degrees, put in my disinfectant to dip them right away. Dip them right away, dry them right away, and then cool them down to 55 degrees as soon as they're dry. And I never store eggs for more than seven days. If I'm going to ship them, I never store them more for about three or four days. I set once a week, I, seven days. That's yes. what I do. Every Sunday. Seven days a week, right? <laughs> no, I only set on one day. One day a week is when I do it. We actually have uh, only ones that I specifically set is our North American Ready Up eggs or our Argentine Ready Up eggs from North Carolina because they have to hatch out a few days before we make our next trip because we need to get started. Because our keeper up, you know, we don't want our keeper up in New York to be messing around with the hard to hard to get them on board. Wow. Well, thanks, guys. Anything else? I got two questions. Yep. All right. First question: uh, with humidity and stuff, causes like crooked toes and everything like that. Now, some people tell me it's a genetic thing because a lot of people they have cockbirds or hens or whatever, and they're more with the cockbirds because of breeding birds. They don't like cells. Now. But I was always told it was a humidity issue, not a genetic. It can be both, but you can test it by letting your hands sit on the eggs. I always use the coachings and silkies to hatch out my eggs. I just started getting back into the yeah. pheasant thing when I was in high school. Actually, <coughs> Art Wyrick's the one that got me involved with it. He lived like 20 minutes away from me. So now I'm finally getting back into the rhythm of raising goldens. So if you had uh, toe issues or anything like that under the hands? No. Yeah. No. I just like when I buy, like when I bought some pheasants or whatever. Even when I bought some goldens off the Ron, yeah, to show you, to show you no crooked toes or anything like that. I just wanted to know if that was a genetic yeah. or it could, be, it could be either, either one. Okay. Yeah, the malady of crooked toes will show up more in inbred lines. Okay. Used to be brown ears are very inbred in this country, and almost every chick that hatched. Either had a rye neck or curved toes or, or um, malformed legs, and it wasn't until we got better genetic stock into this country that things improved. But you can also, with improper incubation, get um, those maladies show up as curved toes. A lot of times, if an egg goes too long in the hatching process, for whatever reason. Um, calcification process starts in the egg and they need that strength to push themselves out of the egg exactly, right. and if they're in that uh, egg too long um, it starts calcifying in the um, they, they sit and so you get those malformed eggs just because it hatched but it took too long to hatch. Okay. Right. I've seen that too but I don't know if you have when I was a young man, if I had a chicken, the egg was having a hard time getting out, and I would break a little bit of the membrane off and wet it to make sure there was no vas vasculature left in that inner membrane, I would help the chick hatch out, and I would open the egg all the way up and actually help the chick pull himself out. Yep. And nine times out of ten, that chick would be splay leg because he didn't make that last effort with his leg to push and pop himself out of the shell. And I'm under the impression that that last push, getting your legs straight out, and getting the hip joint set is very important to the chicks yeah. in the future. Because after a couple of weeks, when I did that to other chicks, you'd have one leg pointing 90 degrees out in one direction or within 24 hours, and they'd be play leg and they couldn't even walk at all. Yeah. So I stopped helping chicks at all. They don't come out on their own. They don't come out. That's fine. That was good. Well, I'll do, you mentioned helping them out. If I ever have a help, I just like, can't open the top. Yeah, and, and then let them do the rest. Open, I'll just 
Let him release his head a little bit just to make sure he can move around yeah, and do the yeah. rest. Because that does two things. That allows him to still go through that whole natural process, yeah. but it also protects it if the yolk has been absorbed all the way. The yolk stays in the egg. Uh, and if you pull them out of the egg, you can get a little bit of yolk on there. It hits that uh, tray, you got bacteria or, or corruption or whatever, um, and you're going to have to check. So I, if you ever help them out, just uh, cut the top open, just get the head loosened up a little bit. That's it. That's all you do with it and leave it alone. I think a lot of that difficulty in getting out of the shell could be attributed to too high humidity during incubation, too. If that egg doesn't lose 15% by the time it uh, pips internally, a lot of times that albumin, albumin that wasn't absorbed turned into a, a gooey substance, almost like the little of glue. And after the chicks in the hatchery start hatching out and get moving around, that, that egg will dry out inside there somewhat, and that chick will be stuck in there with the glue. And then at that point, I'll take a wet sponge. If I see that, if I chip a little egg off, and I see that crusty, gluey stuff, I'll moisten the shell all the way around where he has it pipped, and then let him push out on his own. Then it'll come in and be like dripping wet, sticking, and I know that. That's the other thing goes that you got, you got too high humidity because you have no problem with move around that egg to that egg and break off. And if they have to absorb that yolk, a lot of times, and it is a great place for bacteria because they actually, when they're sucking the yolk back internally, right. is any bacteria. So if, if you've broken the shell out and it's exposed to the to the bottom of the tray, they're inter internalizing that to the abdominal. Bringing it in, and you'll you'll notice that the chick will die three days later um, for no no apparent reason. And, and good time if you were to do a knee crop scan that you find out that it was bacteria running rapid through the chick. A lot of times in commercial, what we would do is take a betadine, um, swab, and swab the yolk if it was still external, and that way trying to kill anything before it actually came back inside. And just a randomized comment, just based on what you just said. Another thing is if you have low humidity or a low temperature runner on your incubator, and if you have some bacteria in your incubator, you can actually have a, a bacterial issue going with the, with the um, inside the, the embryo. When it hatches out, sometimes you'll have birds five days old just die. You don't lose entire clutches five days old just because it cooled the incubator that gave them an opportunity for some bacteria to start growing. And that was when we might have managed to come out the road or they just, the bacteria started growing because the temperature was warmer and that was under the bird, so we under the birds. I think we had another question in the back. Well, I was just going to, I agree with the gentleman in the red shirt, I can't remember your name. Dave. Um, with uh, helping chicks out, I found that if you do too much of the help, that they do end up having deformities and was going to suggest that Clyde did to actually just take the top portion of the shell off and allow them to push themselves out. Exactly. I, I found that that actually works out better. I kept track of it over, right on, yeah. over a period of time and, and came to that conclusion. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. I've had... Uh, <clears throat> hatches in my incubator that I haven't recognized when it's happening and I'd like to avoid it. I've had the same hatch, hatch on the same days. I've had normal hatches. I've had what they call shrink wrap babies and I've had some of those that are hatched with glue all over them. The real sticky glue stuff. How can I avoid all that? What kind of incubator are you using? Just uh, sportsman. Sportsman? Yeah. Are they, and they're all hatching on the bottom shelf? Yeah, all on the hatching shelf. The hatching thing. Are you incubating and hatching in the same machine? Yes. Part of it. If you can if you can afford to have a separate incubator or a separate hatcher, at least an upland uh, species. What we try to do is increase the humidity and stop turning, which if you move them down to the bottom, you're not turning them. But conditions um, are better if you can isolate hatching from incubation. So it, that may attribute to some of the other 
if you've got some sticky chips, it sounds like maybe you're running the incubator a little high humidity. Just the opposite. Yeah, it's got both sides of high and low humidity. Yeah, so maybe it's very. So are you for are you candling eggs? Are you handling the eggs to make sure that the, that the drying down properly? Yeah. You checking the humidity? Yeah. Where are you running your humidity at? 45 to 50. 45 to 50? A little low for hatching. A little low for hatching. And that's, that's where even in, in, in the case where you just just have one you know one incubator using even buying a small little incubator even like a styrofoam to hatch in might be might be the better answer because then you can you can monitor the humidity in that a little bit better for hatching. Yeah, you can buy those GQF uh, digital incubators, the styrofoam ones, for like one hundred thirty dollars. That's what I, I have about five of those. And I hatch exclusively those. I put all my eggs for incubation in the uh, RCOM MM50. So when I get to the three days before hatch, I separate all the bloodlines into the styrofoam incubator, and I bump them up to 65 to 70 percent humidity for hatching out. And then when I'm, when that hatch is all done in that little styrofoam box, I take it outside, hose it out, disinfect it, dry it in the sun, and then get it all set up for the next hatch the following week. And that seems to work out well for me, but. Those old sportsmen where they have the hatching tray at the bottom and the, and the turning cradle on the top, I'm, I'm not a real big uh, advocate of those. It's trying to do too much with one instrument. I think. Yeah, I maintain a sportsman for, for hatching. hatching sure. And then I have a, a Dickies incubator that I bought a long time ago that I use for all my incubators. They're both basically the same machine, but they're... Right. But, uh, but I have Dickies are a lot better built them. I think he's is a big problem. Are they really? Yeah. So it's, I think it is. Uh, I've never Anything else, folks? Yeah, I've got a question. The last one. Um, both of your presentations you said about when having like a breeding stock, you worry about interbreeding and all that, like brother and sister and stuff like that. Is it hard? I mean, it probably is hard now because it's a pandemic, pandemic crap. But is it hard to get other stock? Like wild caught stock, is it hard to get that kind of stuff brought in for us? Yeah, for, for the most part, importation has really been restricted. Um, some things that are coming in from Europe that go to Canada, from Canada here, um, almost nothing is coming from the wild anymore that come because of uh, avian flu. Um, and so we have to kind of treat all the stocks that we have as the best stock that we'll ever have. Now there are some exceptions. I have uh, some um, submarine coppers that came out of Canada that uh, completely different uh, bloodlines than what we have here in the U.S. So there is some things coming in, but for the most part, um, it's very difficult at this time to to bring things in, and almost unheard of from from the wild, uh, with rare exceptions. Uh, um, there are some things that can come come in through Europe and then into quarantine in the U.S., but it's a very expensive undertaking as well. So, um, what I suggest that that everybody is that we share our knowledge and where we um, have purchased things, and that way, if you're buying from two different people, you can figure out, you know, did they buy from the same person or from somebody else, and that uh, we can. Try to get as much diversity as possible. Now there are some species um, that there just hasn't been any importations in decades, and um, in some of those cases we've worked through some bottlenecks and, and come out well on the other side. But in some species, um, we're just not doing well with it all, and we're probably going to lose a number of species in the next 10 to 15 years just from the fact that uh, um, we just don't have good genetic stock left anymore. And that's what my wife and I have been doing is we've been trying to establish like at least five up to ten pairs of everything uh, that we can possibly keep. Um, 
it's cost a lot of money and we certainly can't make any money at it and uh, you know, the imports we're talking about doing some imports from uh, Europe this coming year but we've been working for the past we've got problems with Europe a lot of the European nations are allowing any imports anymore and this Brexit thing is completely shut Britain down there's nothing coming in out of Britain right now we've been six months trying to get stuff into Britain um, we do have with that said we do have a couple of species we got some really good bloodlines on because they came from Africa, wild wild from Africa. There's a couple of nations in Africa that are still um, catching some stuff or some different permits and stuff. But this situation is only going to get worse. Um, it's really important that if everybody has the, the facility, that has means or to make an extra acre to breed some pheasant or, or waterfowl species or whatever that may not be the most appealing, uh, but just for the whole you know, conservation aspect, it's important that we all take a role in that. Uh, because, in, you know, our kids aren't going to be able to see half of what, you know, we've seen. If there are actually, and, and this is where we can learn something from the commercial industry, there are some ways that the commercial industry set up to, to, that they breed a lot of their birds through inbred lines, but to do that they have to have the outcrosses of stuff. So they actually maintain genetically diverse birds by maintaining, like I said, it's four or five different lines, and then the way they breed those together is very systematic. And, and, and actually, the last time I talked with Rich and I talked with Sylvan Heights and a few other breeders as well, um, we've got some species that we have no new bloodlines on. Well, we found that we, we had Chinese spotbills, a great example. Um, I think that we, my wife and I have been the only ones breeding them for at least the past 10 years. Anytime uh, Silver White wants something, he's called something, send them down to them, and put all the preserves and stuff. But what's happened with these, we, we thought we had a, a lethal gene in, in, the, in the spot bills because every time we get down to the last three days of, of incubation period, we'd end up with dead, you know, dead chicks in the shell. This went on for years. But I get like one or two chicks hatched out in the air, so I kept taking them and putting starting a flock down at my other place on North Carolina. And before you know it, I had a flock up in New York and I had a flock in North Carolina and I just treated them as two different bloodlines, two completely different bloodlines. And I ended up putting them back together and we restored fertility. And we're actually producing, this year we'll be producing like 25 of them this year. 25, I don't know what we're gonna do with 25 spot bills because uh, nobody wants them, but you know, we're producing them. Even though they weren't the same line, we weren't essentially breeding direct siblings. Right, we were breeding. Yes. I mean, there, don't get me wrong, there is some direct siblings involved with that, but um, anytime we replace a bird, we replace it from the other flock. Oh, so, yeah. so we try to mix it up as much. Because the bottom line is, if, and it, and it goes back to wild muscovies. <coughs> we raised the keeper of wild muscovies. We've had the, the same bloodline for. 40 years, 40 plus years, I've had the same exact Muscovies. And they, for, for say, Frank Todd and, um, you know, Forward Zoo and stuff, was keeping these Muscovies, dating all the way back to Wild Ball Trust, there's been a mutation that chicks have been coming out with, it's a chocolate color mutation. The last wild color mutation, or last wild color to be hatched out was like 20 years, 25 years ago. And Everybody's just been hatching these chocolate colored mutations. So I've refused to mix blood with anybody else for fear that they contaminate with some domestic because we got crazies that are going out to Texas and pulling them out of parts that are nothing more than domestic duck crosses and putting them in there and they call them wild. But anyhow, I, I persist and I kept this because my belief was that if I continue breeding this, because I, I did have at one point the, them throwing the wild color. And I just had this belief that somehow as preserving all of the genetics in it, and all of a sudden two years ago we started throwing out of random, and it makes no sense because you know you would think that the recessive gene would have been the dominant gene. All of a sudden we're throwing uh, wild muscovies, and we're producing wild muscovies now. Yes, that's a solid job. Yep, and it, makes, it doesn't follow the no genetics or anything. It's, just it, it's so hard to find, like I said, when you deal with inbreeding, because 
you can say, I'm going to buy a pair of birds from this guy and a pair of birds from that guy, and then you find out that they both all came from the same place. Because sometimes people have, you know, real good success with certain species, and next thing you know, that it's them that are providing them to everybody all over the country. So you can ship birds in from California and find out that they're related to birds that you bought from somebody, you know, down in Strasbourg or something. Yeah, we, 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 in our case, we've got a dozen species. Yeah. Anytime we go to get them, they came from us. So, <laughs> question: you, you kind of brought it up. Was the shipping of the birds and the eggs both? There's been a big controversy that I've been seeing on some of the groups about NPIP. Do you have to be or do you not have to? You have to be. You to ship across state lines. And eggs and birds. <laughs> eggs and, yep. and birds. My law. Yep. It, a lot of them go when they're not. Because I don't know who's enforcing the law. I mean, nobody's enforcing through the postal service. You know, my USDA inspector didn't even know you could ship mail Birds in the mail. I'm surprised you didn't tell him to take a hike. You know he's been on a poultry <laughs> farm 30 and, days earlier. And it's going to cost, and it's and cost him more right now to ship too if anybody's trying to ship. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's actually not, that's right. exacerbating this whole uh, unrelated problem. And the, the, the shipping industry it used to be 30 years ago, wasn't even before 1993 or something like that. It was illegal to ship birds through the mail. We were doing it anyway. You could take a bird, you could ship it to California, and by the next morning it would be at its destination. And now we got this scanning and this high technology and stuff. And you, I can't even get it from the, to the next town over five miles away in less than three days. Uh, but not only that, is it cost $150, $200 to ship a damn pair of pheasants. And, you know, when, you, when people don't want to pay, you know, seventy-five dollars for a pair of copper pheasants that Ron brought in from, uh, you know, Canada via, you know, Hong Kong, <laughs> or vice versa. Um, you know that, you, you know, you got thousands of dollars in these things, and you know, people don't want to pay seventy-five dollars, but then you got to pay more in shipping, and yeah. nobody wants to do it. Yeah. So we've got a huge problem ahead of us, not only with getting a hold of our really stock, but just our own. Uh, transport system in the United States. That's why we got to work together. That, that's why you're starting to see these people uh, popping up as, as transporters. You yeah. know, I'm going to go from here to here this week. I can pick you up need some. But, and, and this is why these small clubs and stuff become more important. And it's really great that this, that this club has gotten so big as fast as it did um, because it, it brings a lot of people together. Uh, and it's just, it makes me happy. To see the summer people in the club like this. And, and the board and everything has done a really great job with this club. So. I have a question for you. Is there anybody in the Carolinas and Virginia Club that's keeping a stud book? I know Don Bruning and Don Butler. Right. I try to. I mean, that's one of the things we are trying to encourage is even if you don't have it up till now, begin. Begin today. You know, your next version. There is data that exists. Right. 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 Years ago. When I was Unfortunately, it's probably plagued with a lot of things. People get caught up in the whole collecting mentality, you know, the gathering and the hoarding, and less about moving forward and, and being good stewards for the next generation. So we're trying to kind of invert that a little bit. Yeah. It's a lot of work, too. Yes, but it is. Have, oh, back in the early 90s, they were actually keeping written ledgers. Right. Right. I mean, I've, I've disseminated some spreadsheets to some people and said, here's a good platform just to start with. You know? Well, yeah, I mean, that's just really difficult. Like, even IWA, for, IWA, for example, International Wildlife Law Association, they try to surveys every couple of years. Right. And they only get like 40 respondents. And, yeah. If that. You know, you can't really base any conservation decisions or anything. Uh, 40 and you know 40 respondents and you know you got something like spotted tree guys who's going to be responding myself jacob kramer and yeah. all you need to do is make a phone call hey how many spotted tree ducks you got right you know? right it's uh, record keeping's dismal at best yeah i would encourage everybody if you if there's one take home from today is develop a record keeping system that works for you mm -hmm. and try to maintain as much records as you possibly can um, going into the future will help you 
forever. I mean, I, I try to keep up even with birds where they go because if I have a catastrophic event, I want to be able to call you, hey, I need to get some of my blah, blah, blah back. Yep. So it helps. I mean, and, and people say, well, it won't happen. I can tell you right now, I had a whole battery of pens this year got destroyed. Yep. I mean, had one tree that came down and, you know, there goes 60. And my dad said, it's so important yeah. to yeah. spread yeah. information and give people sort of good aviculture, it's not just aviculture, it's because we're so interdependent on one another, especially with uh, conserving and preserving this stuff in captivity. Right. If John is just sending birds out to people that aren't raising anything, he has a catastrophic event, he's not going to be able to do anything again. Right, right. I need them to be successful. Yeah. It's, it's self motivated. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody, and let's give a round of applause to you.